What I'm going to do is um, paint a little bit of, the, of a picture of the evidence for why it's possible to improve the particular functions that you would like to improve with practice. And I'm going to do that very quickly by pointing to some of the large scientifically run randomized clinical trials that I've participated in over the years. Um, I'll tell you the results, but what's more important is the underlying message of what these studies tell us about how one can improve after stroke or spinal cord injury or multiple sclerosis or any disease. But we'll, of course, here be looking at primarily um, at stroke. Um, so here's a list. Um, I'll give you 10 seconds to copy it down. <laughs> it's a list of all the different kinds of interventions that have been put to good scientific trials. And I couldn't begin to tell you, you know, about all of them, but I will say that um, they all provide us with the same message. And so I'm just going to take a couple of these trials that I've personally been involved in. And by the way, I've spent about $35 million of your tax money uh, in doing these trials. Um, so one is called um, constraint-induced movement therapy, or CIMT. You've heard about this. I was on the, um, helped design this trial and was on the, um, what's called the, the, the committee that provides oversight throughout the trial. And what this trial did was it wanted to see whether um, certain kinds of practice could lead to improved function of a weak arm after stroke. And these patients who had the stroke were able, did have some movement in the hand, so they could extend their wrist a little bit and extend a few fingers a little bit, but they were slow and clumsy and trying to use the hand. Um, these folks were given 10 straight days of therapy, and this therapy was provided by therapists for six hours a day. You know, real pulse, heavy pulse of therapy. This was about from three or nine months after the onset of the stroke. They also wore a glove on their unaffected hand. So they were forced to use their affected hand throughout the day at home uh, and in ways that, you know, tried to keep them safe. And it turned out that with this intensive amount of therapy, which added up to several hundred hours, a day uh, in, in, the, in the course of the uh, trial, that patients use their hand far better to do large and small scale activities, reaching, grasping, pinching, holding things, than the people who got usual care. Quite a dramatic difference in 10 days of this really intensive therapy. However, if you compare this kind of intervention to equally intensive therapies, regardless of how you practice, but you make them oriented to tasks that you want to accomplish, you get equivalent results without using the glove and not necessarily needing to have a therapist working with you for those six hours for 10 days, but rather even as little as just two hours while you practice on your own. And so it's not that the constraint of the unaffected hand matters, it's the practice with the affected hand that matters. What could give you even more practice? Well, a robotic device. And here are several kinds of robotic devices. Um, this is uh, an early one. This is a late one that allows you to move your whole arm and helps you, um, assists you uh, as you're using it to be able to move through a maze or do different tasks by moving your shoulder up and down or extending your elbow or moving your wrist. This really elegant robotic device that you could put in your home for about $100,000, um, it turned out in a VA trial was as good as, but no better than, the same amount of time spent practicing without the robotic device. So an intensive course of therapy, practicing trying to do tasks like reaching, lifting, pulling, pinching, uh, was um, as good as using the expensive robotic device. We were all disappointed in this, but the message for you is that greater intensity of practice doing tasks that you want to accomplish can lead to your being able to do those tasks better. These devices didn't cure anyone. They just made it smoother and faster 
to make movements. Um, we did a trial for walking that was very simply designed. I got 18 sites around the world to open up their inpatient rehab units to a single intervention. And this was an intervention to test whether feedback about how you're doing could lead to better performance. If you knew what you were doing, if you knew what you were accomplishing, would you end up accomplishing even more? And so in this case, the feedback was really simple. Every day, after patients were randomized to one of two interventions, they got a certain kind of feedback. One group got feedback about how fast they walked 10 meters. That's about 30 feet. The other group didn't get any of that feedback about how fast they walked each day. And at the end of about three weeks of inpatient rehab, it turned out that the group that got information about how fast they walked each day walked 23% faster. In a sense, they pushed themselves a little more. They, maybe they took more chances. Maybe their therapists got competitive. You know, well, gee, we did such and such yesterday or last week. Let's see if we can up the ante a little bit. Uh, this randomized clinical trial cost $3,000 to pull off. The two trials I showed you before that each cost up to $8 million to pull off. The results were equivalent in, in, in the sense of the amount of increase in, in, in outcomes that we saw. And so how, getting feedback could be a very valuable thing to do, even at home. We developed um, something actually with folks in the stroke group, um, with the, the Southern California um, Stroke Association. We, our engineers and computer scientists uh, developed these small accelerometers that we place over the ankles. And by walking with these, we can capture how fast you walk, how many times you walk, whether you're walking or bicycling or exercising. We can capture all the activities someone's doing in the home and community. And so what does this let us do? It lets us give you feedback while you're at home about how you're doing. And the idea was, well, if we gave people feedback about their performance, how would they do? So to start that off, we did a little trial we call CIRAC. So remember, I just showed you a trial where all we did was give people feedback about how fast they were walking each day during inpatient therapy. This time, we gave one group just information about how fast they walked, and the other group got information about how far did you walk that day? How fast did you walk? How many steps did you take? How smooth was your walking? How symmetric was one leg compared to the other? And the therapist gave the patients this kind of feedback. And it turned out in this trial that patients who got the extra feedback ended up walking much further each day and doing better than the group that only got feedback about walking speed. And so information about how you're doing and some of the details of that can have a profound effect on helping perhaps patients figure out, you know, I'm, I'm not doing enough. You know, you, you get this real-time information. Maybe I could do a little bit more. Maybe I could push this a little bit harder. And you have this instrumented gate that allows you to, um, to measure that. On this trial, we did all over the world. Um, India, Cairo, Turkey, Taiwan, South Korea, um, North, uh, Central America, the Mayo Clinic, all kinds of, you know, weird places. And um, the, um, the results were the same at each site. So we showed that no matter where you are, whatever your culture is, that getting a little more feedback seems to have a profound effect on performance. Um, I've been involved in treadmill training with partial body weight support. This is, um, we hope to be a major contribution to getting people to walking better by sus holding some of their weight in a harness suspended, whoop, suspended over a treadmill belt and having therapists assist them with stepping. They could take more steps. They could step faster because the treadmill belt would ingrain that stepping. Uh, and, we com and we also train them to walk over ground. I, I spent quite a few years in the early 90s trying to optimize this. We did a trial in spinal cord injury people with recent spinal cord injury, and it turned out that walk, the treadmill training was no better than overground training, much to my disappointment. That was about a $4 million study. <laughs> Not to be dissuade, um, we, tr we transferred this to people with stroke, 
and uh, with a group of investigators spent $12 million comparing treadmill training with weight support and overground training to a different intervention, a home intervention, in which people got therapy in their home with a therapist that didn't emphasize walking, but emphasized strengthening and balance and managing to get around in their own home. This is um, the study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. So it was <coughs> treadmill training versus um, this home-based rehab. And it turned out both groups improved considerably, but they were equal in outcomes. So what can we learn from this? Well, the task-specific walking on a treadmill you'd think would carry over better to walking in the real world than just practicing strengthening and stretching and balance. But the therapy done in the home may have given people a new context for practice. And this is very important for you. Where you practice may be as important as what you practice. And so by practicing in the home, this group solved the problem of getting around in their own home with the therapist, as opposed to going to a clinic, getting on a treadmill, and then trying to transfer what they learned to back to the home. And so practice in your own home can be then a very powerful tool uh, for improvement in those things you choose to improve. We've tried using robots to help stepping. This is a robot called the Locomat. Uh, perhaps some of you here tried. It turned out that when we did a trial that in general, people who practice on the robotic device which helps assist the leg for walking don't do any better than people who practice the same amount of time, with the same intensity, walking over ground. Um, this raises the question whether body weight supported treadmill training and robotic assistive stepping devices for locomotor walking training ought to go trot back to the starting gates and we ought to rethink just how it is we can help people practice more. Um, this is an iconoclastic article for which I have been um, chased by big guys from the Bronx by the companies that make these devices. <laughs> um, so what, what can we say we've learned? Well, it means that you can get a pulse of goal-directed therapy and it could help you at any time after stroke. The patients I showed you, some were three to six weeks post-stroke, some were three to nine months post-stroke, some were one to three years post-stroke. It really didn't matter. What matters is that you do the task that you want to practice. You do it repetitively. So if you want anything that you do once, you need to be doing 10 or 20 times. If you want to practice getting out of the chair, and you get up, and you're, wow, I got out of that chair a little better than usual, sit down again and get up again. Do it, try to do it five or six times in a row and develop a flow of more automatic movements. You want to gradually increase the difficulty of your practice. Try to do it a little faster, a little smoother, a little more like it's done normally. Um, try to do it under different circumstances. You're trying to put a key in the door. You could be sitting, you could be standing. Put the dishes away. Put, put your, your clothes back into a drawer. Practice your standing and balance while you're also practicing your reaching and your grasping. It takes a lot of problem solving. You know, how can I do this a little better? Sometimes the therapist can help you design your therapy. And think about feedback. Measure your gains. Think, am I doing this faster? I'll time myself walking for 50 feet. Let's see if I can walk a little faster next week if I do a little more practice. Or I walked 200 feet. Let's see if I can walk 250 feet in two weeks if I keep practicing and pushing myself. You can use the therapist then to help you succeed, but ultimately, you need to practice in your home environment. I think that's one of the major messages here. A parallel message is that you don't get any gains from passive treatment. You have to be engaged. You have to be involved. There are no miracle cures out there. You have to drive the neural mechanisms for skills learning. So this practice isn't something that's just happening out there in the world. It's changing the way your brain manages information. It's transforming the, the, the smoothness and the 
rem the memory of brain pathways for carrying out those tasks. The practice actually makes stronger connections between the nerve cells in the synapses that make you able to carry out a skilled task. And so you're training your brain as you train yourself. I want to just briefly touch on two things. They're very controversial, but that's my style. There's a dermatologist in the 100 UCLA Medical Building that some of you have heard about. His name is Tobinick. He published this uh, article recently in which he gave 629 of his patients, who each paid about $3,000, that adds up, uh, a, what's called a TNF inhibitor. It's an, an inflammatory inhibitor that's used for rheumatoid arthritis. The drug company, Amgen, tells us there is absolutely no use utility for this drug for people with stroke or Alzheimer's disease or back pain. But he's been using it for years. And reports here giving this around the spine doesn't go into the spinal fluid. It goes somewhere, maybe gets absorbed by some of the veins of, uh, uh, in your low back when it's injected into the, into the back near the spinal cord. And um, in this study, he paid for the biostatistician to do the statistical analysis. He paid his staff to look at the data in the records. And he did the evaluations. And what were the evaluations? Before getting the injection, he'd look at the person and have them do something like talk or walk. Then he'd give the injection, and he'd look at them again, do the same thing. He said, you know, you're better. You get a, instead of getting a, a one, you get a two on this test. You know, I think you're better. And then he puts it in his chart. And then someone goes back and looks at the statistics. You know, did people get better? And lo and behold, having made at least a couple of million dollars injecting this stuff, he concluded that people got better. And he should, people should keep coming to him to do this. The same thing happens in offshore sites that sell stem cells or whatever. We don't know what kind of cells they're actually giving you. But there's a lot of push for using cells uh, in Mexico and China. I've actually followed some people who've done this. Many of them have had complications. We don't know what the cells are. We don't know what they're meant to do. Um, what's the major patient selection criteria for getting cells? Money. You've got enough money to pay for them. Um, there's no follow-up. Any anecdotes that you hear are just like the ones I told you about Tobinick. They're just people's opinions. Um, there's no a priori planned standard assessment that's reliable and reproducible. It's just opinion. <coughs> there is a scientific side to this, and Dr. Carmichael will touch on this, in which there are places in which um, cells are beginning to be tested in stroke. They've already been tried in one or two trials. And people don't pay to participate in those studies. They are allowed to be in those studies because these are controlled trials with scientifically developed designs and people who are paying attention to protecting your rights and your safety, unlike the other situation. You should never pay to be in a trial. It is not ethical. Um, and so you want to practice what you hope to improve. You can practice any time, any place. Pursue the tasks that are most meaningful to you, the things that will improve your quality of life. And you can, above all, if you're feeling a little blue during this process, um, you need to get support from your peers. You need to think about, am I getting a little depressed about this? Do you need some help? And Dr. Merrill's going to touch on that uh, issue. So I thank you. <laughs>